Excuse me, Mr. Michael. Yeah. Alright. What do you want to know? Uh, about the 1910s. Well, the first thing that comes to mind when I hear the word 1910s would be obviously World War I and the U.S. entering, or taking part of it, because uh, that was a big part of history. Um, Machu Picchu was also discovered. The Mona Lisa was stolen. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was elected president, which is also what the document that Adriana is doing is on. Henry Ford makes the first automobile. Um, and also the Titanic sinks. In a fashion sense of thinking, during the early 1910s, a straight, natural hobble skirt replaced the weird ass figure of 1908. That only lasted about five years until 1915 when a full skirt just above the ankles replaced the hobble skirt. v necks were also made popular around this time. In the 1918s, clothes became more straight and curves, much like a boy's slip. In men's, in men's style, a sack coat slash lounge coat has always been present. Famous people like Charlie Chaplin, which was an actor, Harry Houdini, a famous magician, and Henry Ford, who created the first automobile, have been well around. Inventions like the zipper made life possible. Without them, our pants would be falling. Toasters also made life possible. Who wants dry old bread? The first military tank was also invented. This was used by Britain in 1916 during World War One. In the music, jazz was basically all you heard in the radio station. Movies like Frankenstein by Thomas Edison were first made, and so was Romeo and Juliet. You know what? I'm really ashamed of myself. I completely forgot to say that Romeo and Juliet was also made in 1916. Favorite thing in the world, something that without it life would be impossible to live in, was invented. This one thing is Oreos. Heroification is a degenerative process that makes people over into heroes. Through this process, our education media turns flesh and blood individuals into heroes, perfect creatures without conflicts, pain, credibility, or human interest. Page 19. Lawn describes her vocation as a process in which history textbooks portray a character in history unrealistically in order to show them in a positive light. They leave out any facts that would make them seem bad. Some examples of her vocation. Example number one. American interpret is not free. The man with only a little capital is finding it harder and harder to get into the field. More and more impossible to complete with the big fellow. Why? Because the laws of this country do not prevent the strong from crushing the weak. Woodrow Wilson, The New Freedom, 1913, page 687. Example number two. The Federal Reserve Act was a red letter achievement. It carried the nation with flying banners through the financial crisis of the First World War of 1914 to 1918. Without it, the Republic's progress towards the modern economic age would have been seriously retarded. Woodrow Wilson. Um, textbook might, but don't call Wilson's Latin American actions a bad neighbor policy. Instead, faced with unpleasantries, textbooks wriggle to get the hero off the hook. Land of Promises is vague as to who caused the invasion, but seems certain they were not Wilson's doing. Page 24. So why is it that textbooks go out of their way to make sure we know who is a hero and who's not? And why is it so easy to take it as present and believe it? Well, Lowen's answer says it all. The author's omission and errors can hardly be accidental. The producers of the film strips, movies, and other educational materials on Helen Keller surely know she was a socialist. No one can read Keller's writing without becoming aware of her political and social philosophy. Wilson's racism is also well known to professional historians. Why don't they let the public in on these matters? Page 32. Driving question is, how do the lessons we learn from history, from historians, for instance, and other writers, for instance, 
and from cultural artifacts, parentheses, objects, buildings, monuments, statues, music, etc. Parentheses, shape our understanding, understanding and tolerance. As humans, at a young age, we are taught what not to do and what to do. Like, when we're in middle school, they tell us, don't do drugs because it's bad, and then we grow up with that kind of mentality that this is bad, this is good, and that's, those are the actions we form. So whoever taught us about the meaning of intolerance, those are the kind of uh, ideal, those are the ideals we grew up with throughout our lives. Like, let's say your parents raised you up to think that whites are the, uh, the supreme race in the, in the earth then you'll grow up thinking that you're better than everybody else. But if your parents or somebody else teaches you that we are all equal, we, all, we are all the same, then you grew up with, with a more tolerant and understanding mind than others have. Got it? Yeah,